Now I have a real surprise for you. We're not only going to be talking about Australian properties, we're actually going to be talking about some US properties as well. Now along the same theme where we're talking about inspiration and stories, I thought it would be remiss of me if we didn't include some of the international successes that a lot of my students are actually having. Now my next uh, student who's joining me here on the farm, he started here in Australia and for him it was all about paying off debt, pay off the home. But then once that was done, it was about let's create some passive income. So let's hear his story. This is my great mate who has helped me out with so many things, including the feasibility study program that I know is helping so many, so many of my students out there. It's John Bone. Hey, John, great yep. to have you here. Great. Pleased to be here. <laughs> Are you enjoying the farm? Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, John. Now, apart from helping me out with doing feasibility studies and, and uh, putting programs together for me, you've been pretty busy over the last few years. How long have we been together now? We've been together since 2008, which was when we did the, the ultimate course. Right. But Jan started with you with Wildly Wealthy Women, and which I think was probably back in what? about 2006. Goodness me, that's a long mm, time ago. It is a long it? time. <laughs> and we're getting a lot older. <laughs> Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about what you've done. Now, your first priority was to um, pay off your home. Was that right? Correct. We wanted to be debt free. Yeah. Yes. Because you actually quit work. Soon yes. after um, you joined, you did quit work, didn't you? What happened for us was that uh, we decided that in order to make sure that we were successful in real estate, that we needed to join the Platinum Program. Mm -hmm. And that for us to be successful in that venture, then one of us had to give up our jobs. And that was going to be me, Jan. Right. And you volunteered, did you? Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't earning much at the time. So to replace my income wasn't going to be such a big yeah. deal. Mm -hmm. But we started it um, in 2008, which is when we did the ultimate program. Mm -hmm. And then the first uh, session of the ultimate for 2009 was in 2008. Mm -hmm. And then I, and I actually resigned before I started Platinum, mm -hmm. but I stayed on for a couple of extra months and then eventually left work in January 2009. Okay, so the first thing you did was do a um, manufactured growth deal for sale purposes so that you could get a chunk of money to pay down your personal debt, which that's, was your home debt, right. wasn't it? That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started that project in May 2009, which was only a few months after we started the Platinum Program. Okay, so let's talk about that. Now, the research that went into selecting that particular property, because you, you needed something that was going to be saleable at the end, you needed something that was going to make a chunk of money, yep. enough to pay off your debt. That's yep. right. Okay, yes. so how did you conduct your research there? Well, to start off with, we, we wanted a project that was going to make us at least $250,000. So that mm -hmm. was, um, we, were, we went into a joint venture with a builder. Yep. So we were looking for that kind of result, um, mm -hmm. hopefully in 18 months. Yep. So what we did was we just got together and decided which, uh, which suburbs we would target. And mm -hmm. we decided to target the sort of near north suburbs of Melbourne, which is... Mm -hmm. Because you live in Melbourne. Pasco Vale, Nidri, yep. Airport West. Yep. And Airport West was probably our preferred suburb mm -hmm. because it was at the little at the lower end in terms of buy-in price mm -hmm. um, but that turned out to be not the case and um, so we we just looked around the, the area we went to pretty much every auction we went to every home open that was mm -hmm. um, that was any anything that was open in that in the t in the two months leading up to when we eventually decided what we were doing mm -hmm. so we pretty much knew every house in the area that was for sale and that's that's a big part of you know due diligence. You you really need to know your target market very very well. Well, for us it was about finding out what we're selling. Uh, you mm. know, we knew we knew we could buy and, and knock down a house. That mm. was, that's the easy part. But we wanted to find out what we're selling and what it was selling yeah. for. Yeah. And that's why we went to all the builders' home opens and, and mm. had a look around. Um, so we knew exactly what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we were fairly confident that we could build something that was better than what they were building and, yeah. and therefore guarantee us the price that was being sold for at the time. Okay. So talk me through that. You selected a property in Nidri? In Nidri, yeah. Yep. And uh, you decided to build a four-bedroom duplex on each side? It was um, three bedrooms plus a study, okay. yeah. So mm -hmm. fairly small study, mm -hmm. um, you know, bathrooms upstairs and downstairs. Mm -hmm. So... so uh, at, now, the, at the top end of the market. So we were looking for reasonably high quality finish. Okay. Now you selected that size because that was what was in demand in that area. It was kind of a bit of a transition area from memory. 
it, it is a transition area. A lot of um, young people moving into the area and people with, with uh, young families because mm -hmm. there's a lot of good schools in the area. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it was a fairly high price area. At the time we were looking, the uh, townhouses were selling for around $680,000. So mm -hmm. it wasn't at the low end of the market. Uh, it's within 800 metres of um, transport and cafes and, uh, you know. So it's all of those area. due diligence fundamentals, you, you basically went through and ticked them all off. Yes. And yes. it met all the criteria. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So construction started and I understand you got a little bit of rain down there. <laughs> the day we started, it rained, started to rain. Yeah, and it rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. <laughs> and every time we dug a hole, it would fill up with water. And it was a mess. And it... But, but that really wasn't the biggest problem. Well, I suppose it, indirectly it was the biggest problem because whenever the weather was fine, all of the tradesmen would go to the big builders. Mm. Uh, so Because at that time, uh, the big builders were building hundreds and hundreds of homes in places like Packenham and yeah. Narry Warren and yeah. in the outer suburbs. So the, all the trades had sort of pretty much guaranteed work in those areas. So. Mm. Uh, whenever the weather was fine, we couldn't find a tradesman for anything. Yeah. We eventually had to bring a bricklayer out of retirement and um, my partner and I worked as bricklayers, labourers for about three months. Mm. And, and we did all of the framing for the lower level. We put up all the steel ourselves because we just couldn't find people to do it. Wow. Okay, so obviously there's obstacles through that, that process. How did you deal with that? Well, it, it was just basically um, suck it up and move on, really. <laughs> Get on with it. <laughs> Get on with it. I mean, something had to be done. We couldn't leave the site just sitting there doing nothing. So mm. um, we had to move it along and mm. we moved it along just by getting people as we could and working whenever we could. So okay. we spent a lot of time on the site ourselves. Mm. And, and that eventually cut deeply into our profits because mm. we, we ended up taking over two years to do and, mm. and that for a construction. Holding costs. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it was costing us about $6,000 a month and holding mm. costs towards the mm. end. So so there was a fairly um, heavy impost, you know, mm. and holding costs, yeah. Now, one of the things that, um, you know, I teach people to do and advise them to get out there and make happen, you really executed very, very well, and that is marketing your property as soon as you started to have something to show. And yeah. uh, you actually produced a, a pretty handy brochure that you, you marketed to all the real estate agents. That's right. We, we, wanted, we basically wanted to have a situation, or I wanted to have a situation, where uh, the real estate agents felt that it was easier to sell our house than anybody else's. Mm. Uh, so that's why I put together the marketing brochures for them. So they really didn't have to get out, go out of their office to sell. Mm. I didn't want a situation where, where we were getting towards the end of the project and we were relying on things like advertising and home mm. opens. I wanted them sold off the plan. That way we could give people the incentive with um, uh, reductions in stamp duty and all that, those yeah. kinds of things that, that people were able to get in Victoria. Particularly Victoria, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's why we went that way. So you got some architectural drawings done, the artist's impressions yep. and, and spent quite a bit of time and effort putting together a pretty substantial brochure that was for, so people could see because a lot of people buyers yes. particularly don't have imaginations no and i and i took all of the artwork to office works and had it all professionally printed yeah uh, on good quality paper um, laminated and mm. put in folders with cds and all that kind of thing so mm -hmm. so um so the situation we had was relatively simple the mm. agents did not have to leave their their mm. premises and the only advertising we did was a board up in front of the building uh, yeah. when we were constructing and a sign in the real estate agent's window that was all we did mm -hmm. and, and you sold, sold them both off the plan we sold them um, what happened was we, we went to the uh, agents in july yep uh, no august sorry it was august it was still fairly wet uh, but we wanted to get in for september which is the big mm. kind of selling season in in um, in melbourne but September was also wet. It still hadn't stopped raining. It had been raining for nearly two years at that stage. It still hadn't stopped. So we gave the agents an extension and they eventually sold in the first and second week of October. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we had them both sold. Yep. What profit did you make on that? We sold, we expected to sell for 680,000. We sold for 800,000. <laughs> and what we found out later was that the reason why they sold for that much and the agents were, were keen to sell for that much was because they were actually setting a record for the area. Mm. So when we sold, we sold the first one for 800,000 um, and that set a record. And then we sold the second one for 805,000 and that broke the record. But, wow. that, but that was a little bit of internal um, 
rivalry going in, on in the real estate agents, we found okay. out later. Okay. So we sold well above what we expected, <laughs> but we only made fractionally more than what we expected. We made about three hundred thousand okay. dollars on the on the project, but we, we probably could have made four hundred thousand mm. with what we lost in um, interest. Uh, because of the extra time and what we had to pay labourers and, and uh, tradesmen was mm. well above mm -hmm. uh, the normal asking rates just to get them on site. But it did achieve your goal of paying off your mortgage? Absolutely. We made more than we, we set out to make, so that was a good thing. Yep. Um, and we learned a lot along the way. And, and after that, we were debt free. Okay. Yep. So debt free. First target done and dusted. Took you Correct. a couple of years, but you, you got that underway? Yes. Then what? What was the next goal after that? Well. After that, there's a kind of a personal situation that was going on while all this was happening, and that is that I was unemployed and, and Jan, my wife, uh, was working as a contractor for the National Bank and there was no certainty in her continued employment. Mm. So we were kind of on a knife edge for a long time through the latter part of that construction because we weren't sure at any time if the bank was going to say, mm. well, you know, you're not earning any money anymore, so mm. um, they might withdraw the finance, but we managed to get there in the end and she managed to keep her employment. Um, but we knew by the time that that project came to an end, we knew that we had to find some ready means of, of cash flow, some sort of instant cash flow, um, because Jan's employment was just so uncertain at the time yep. and still is today. And yep. that was making it very, very difficult for us to move forward because we couldn't borrow. Mm. Um, our tax returns for many, many years hasn't hadn't shown any uh, steady income so uh, we were hampered in that respect mm. and, and doing this project in Nidri we had to use all of our own cash because we couldn't finance any of it not even the purchase of the property right so uh, so for two and a half years we really couldn't do another project no. and that was holding us up so the um, we went to the cash flow USA um, thing in 2010 mm -hmm. and that was well and truly sort of during the the construction phase and we thought this may be the best way we can move yeah um, and then we went we decided that as soon as the project in Nidri was finished we'd go to the US and, right. and we went in um, we settled in um, the two properties in August 2011 mm -hmm. and we went to the US in October 2011 okay. Okay. initially we went over there just to invest our superannuation money mm -hmm. because that had been sitting going nowhere for years mm. so we went over in October and we bought four properties while we we're there. What kind of values did you spend on those properties? The most expensive one we bought was $150,000. That was in Texas. That was a um, um, what you call an A property. Mm -hmm. um, very nice house in mm -hmm. a homeowners association area. Mm -hmm. um, with good growth? With good, excellent growth. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were saying 20% growth potentially. What and do you think it's worth today? It's probably worth $260,000. Wow, and you bought it for one hundred and fifty. dollars Yeah. It's pretty good. And that was in October 2011. So yeah. 18 months later, it'd be about yeah. 260,000. Yeah. Yeah. And bought, it was neutral deposit of the cash flow? It was, well, it was out of super. So um, yeah, there was, was no interest, yeah. but, it, but it was returning about 7% okay. cash flow mm -hmm. in addition to the growth. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we bought uh, two properties in, in Indiana. Mm -hmm. They were for 54,000 and 56,000. Right. And they are returning about 14%. Now flow. they were what? They were probably a B class property or might have been a C? Probably C. C plus, um, something like yeah, that? Yeah, C plus. They, yeah. Were, they were different from the normal houses in the area in mm. that they were what they, the Americans call bi-level. Mm -hmm. So they were on two levels. Uh, right. Uh, rooms under, upstairs Split and level, downstairs. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. essentially. Although the rooms downstairs are really like a basement. Yeah. Um, but they were different and what we were looking for was in all of the properties we were looking for um, houses with a point of difference. Mm. We didn't want to get into a market where um, if the rental market fell down or the uh, ability to sell the properties was um, on the decline, mm. we wanted something that would separate our houses from other houses. And mm -hmm. The one in Texas was the same in that mm. um, it had a balcony. None of the other houses had a balcony. It was just yeah. more difference, but we're yeah. looking for difference. Okay, so uh, you bought one for growth. Now, obviously, you went to uh, my boot camp about the US, yes. got introduced to the team, and you know the the systems and the the processes and the accountants and the the lawyers and yes. all of the everything that I've you know set mm -hmm. up there. So you connected with all of those. You got all your structures in place. You got all of the yes. the um, the fundamentals right. Yes. Bought one in uh, in Texas, Texas for growth, yes. which you've obviously had some very good growth on that, yep. and looking after itself yep. in super. 
couple in um, of lower class properties probably than the other one, yep. but but high yielding. I mean, 14% yes. is a very good return. Yes, yes. Have you had any growth on those properties? Because you probably didn't buy it expecting any. The, the real value of those was is probably around about $70,000 each. Okay, so you've um, had some growth there too. There would be some yep. growth. Uh, they're, they're, they're nice properties. They're in, the, mm -hmm. they're in nice areas. Both the houses yep. are in uh, courts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there's no traffic. Uh, yep. One of them is not far from a church, so it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite nice mm -hmm. uh, Christian areas, yep. you know, mm -hmm. so nothing wrong with them at all. Mm -hmm. um, so then we went to... Uh, it's a big place, it's only Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to Pennsylvania, yeah. We went to Pennsylvania um, and we bought a house there for $38,000. Right. Um, oh, right. <laughs> And that was that was just because it kind of topped off the three hundred thousand dollars we so, had. Because that's what you had left to spend, <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> you know, like kids in a lolly store. I've only got two dollars. What can yeah, I have? <laughs> and that's exactly what we did. So we bought a thirty-eight thousand dollars house that re is returning about sixteen <laughs> percent. Oh wow! It must be a C-class property. <laughs> and, uh, and it was. It's probably been uh, the best one because that's had a tenant in it from day one, and they always pay their rent on time. Pay seven hundred dollars a month or something mm -hmm. from it. Yeah. Never had any maintenance issues, so no problems with that one whatsoever. Okay. Now, how did you find the team over there? Because one of the things that I recommend is that you have a, a strategic meeting before you go, hmm. so that uh, you know you plan out which areas, what type of properties, who you're going to see, all of that kind of stuff. How did that go for you? Well, I, I think I can safely say that we, we would not have done it had it not been for the team that we met um, because we knew that what we were doing was going to be reasonably secure. We were dealing with professional people mm. um, and certainly when it came to the wholesalers, uh, mm. we dealt with the people we liked. Mm. Um, you know, we felt that we could trust them. We felt that we could deal with them yep. remotely um, and, and we've since gone and done that. We've bought other properties and in the those management. areas. And the management. The property management. Yep. Yeah. But the property management is something that, um, uh, in a lot of ca in some cases, we've changed over the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's not been really an issue for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes uh, property managers, well, property managers are property managers. Yes. It doesn't matter whether they're they in change, the US or they here. They move, they whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've changed some property managers, but mm -hmm. all of the properties are performing now. Okay. So that was your spend money that was in, in the super. super. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you do outside super? What happened then was that once we got the super money all sort of safely tucked away, uh, I went back in March 2012. Mm -hmm. and um, First of all, the super money you're now earning on what your properties are investing, I mean, you've obviously got great growth as well as, yes. as cash flow. Yep. Um, how does that compare to what it was doing beforehand? Well, it wasn't doing anything before. It was going backwards. <laughs> we were putting money in and it was disappearing in fees. <laughs> So, you know, negative to positive was always Great. going to be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. What, what were you doing outside Super? Um, I went back in March uh, to have a look at some new markets that were being opened up in the US mm -hmm. for um, uh, Australian investors. Mm -hmm. I bought a six unit multi while I was there. In, right. And um, that's got about a 16% return. Okay. I've had some difficulty with tenants with that, but that's now been sorted out. Mm -hmm. Um, and then since then, we've bought three other properties. How much did that property cost you, the six unit? It cost 115000 Right. Mm -hmm. It's probably worth not much more than that today. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, it's a six unit multi. It's yep. considered to be commercial. Yeah. So if we sold it with a capitalisation rate of 10%, then it would obviously have some growth. Yeah, okay. And that's essentially the way we looked at it. it was but it's purely, cash flow. Yeah, it's cash flow. Purely and simply cash yep. flow. Um, and the advantage, of course, for us in that respect is that the interest rates are going down and the uh, exchange rate is going down as well. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then we bought another uh, three. We mm -hmm. bought sight unseen mm -hmm. uh, in the markets that we'd already been to. Okay, let, let me just qualify that because I don't like people buying sight unseen in Australia, mm -hmm. let alone in the US. However, once you've been and you've looked and you're comfortable with the team and you know exactly what it is, mm -hmm. you'll understand, particularly in the US, you know, you just want another one of those. I'll have another one of them. So you know the, you know what you're getting and you know the standard of renovation or rehab that's being done on the property. So uh, and I'm okay with that yeah. happening once you've been. Yeah, and we were dealing with, um, with people we'd dealt with before yeah. and met before. Yeah. Okay, um, so you bought, how many? Two more. We bought three more. Three one, more. One was a four-unit multi. Right. Um, and that, there was a few odd st funny stories about that. They found an extra bedroom on, <laughs> uh, on the top floor that they hadn't counted when they sold it to Great. me. Great. 
Oh, I'm glad it was that way, not the other way. Yeah, we lost right. a bedroom, sorry. The wholesalers can't count, obviously. It's a bit of a worry. <laughs> um, and they put a coin laundry in the basement, and I get 50% of the money that goes into the coin laundry. Okay. I haven't mm -hmm. seen any of that yet, so okay. I must be bulging with money by now, but I'm not <laughs> sure what's going on there. Um, but that's only finished, finished uh, about two months ago. Right. Uh, and I've got three, three tenants of now of the four, mm -hmm. so I've still got one more tenant. Mm -hmm. And the other two, um, one uh, was rehabbed and finished about three months ago and had a tenant in immediately. Mm -hmm. And the other one has finished about oh, a month ago and still waiting for a tenant. So what did you pay for those three? The uh, four unit multi we paid 121000 for. Right. That was with all the closing costs. And what kind of level area would that have been in? It's probably at a B minus. Okay. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. C plus. Okay. Sort of. Um, it's only three kilometres from a CBD. Right. Uh, it's in an area where there's a lot of public transport, but there's a lot of schools and there's a lot of uh, hospitals. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, more for people, not, not so much for nurses, but more domestic staff, mm. you know, that kind of area. That's where those sort of people okay. live. And the other two? The other two uh, were about $55,000 each and mm -hmm. they're returning about 16%. Okay. Um, Which is good. Yeah. Um, so, or they will, when I've got a tenant in one of them anyway, <laughs> it will be about 16%. But it's only just been finished rehab, yeah, it's only, so Yeah, that's it's only just been finished, yes. Okay. And the, both of those are in, in very nice streets and a very good school district. Okay. So B class areas? Uh, probably B minus, yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. So. Where, that's all for the US? Uh, that was all for the US. Those properties, by the way, the, the, um, those $50,000 properties that I bought, the last yeah. two, yeah. They, uh, their pre-GFC prices were more like ninety and dollars and $110,000. Mm. So, so the likelihood for them to rebound up to their yeah. um, normal you know, economic pricing, prices, not yes. the inflated pricing, but normal economic pricing is quite high. It would be high. So yeah. you're picking up probably, you know, Thirty, forty thousand dollars on each one. On each one yeah. for that. And they're also in area where there's a reasonably high degree of home ownership. Yeah. It's not not necessarily high uh, rental population. Mm -hmm. So so there's a potential for retail sales. So where does that put you? I mean, you've been throwing numbers at me here, and I'm trying to calculate in my head. What's the uh, what's the income coming in from Super now out of the US? Uh, about thirty thousand dollars a year. That's that's at parity. Right. And outside Super is about the same. Okay. And what's the um, um, what's the, the the growth that you've experienced so far on those properties? Do you feel uh, probably close to about seventy percent on average? No, uh, I'll put it to you this way: we've spent six hundred thousand dollars, or a little over six hundred and sixty thousand yeah. dollars, and the yeah. properties would be over a million dollars now. Gee, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. So you you've really strategically placed yourself for growth. And hey, we've got passive income too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. very good. All right. Now, you and I have had many a conversation about the US and the Australian dollar and mm -hmm. all of this sort of thing. And as you indicated before, we, you know, some of that money, the non-super money, you've borrowed against your home that you've now paid off. That's right. Taken it over to the US to buy properties in the US. Yes. Um, so you're paying interest on that money back over here against your Australian asset. Yeah. So um, interest rates have come down. Uh, you yes. know, what kind of interest rate you're paying at the moment? 5.6. Okay, so five odd percent yep. um, uh, on, uh, on the borrowed money there. Mm -hmm. So it's effectively, you really haven't put any money in, you've just borrowed the money to put in. Correct. Yep. And you've got a passive income on top of that. Yep. And you and I both expect the Australian dollar to come down even further. Yes. What was, oh, the, uh, what was the exchange rate <laughs> when you bought most of those properties? 103 was the average. Okay. I bought out. Uh -huh. uh, some transfers I did at as high as um, 1.06, mm -hmm. and I think I did one that was um, uh, 99997. <laughs> or something. I think there was only one I actually did that was below parity. Okay, okay. So the Australian dollar comes down to where we probably, well, I believe, where it's going to come down. Come down to to um, say 80. the 85, maybe even yeah. 80. Let's go 85 you'll get a nice at least 15 to 18% um, growth on the property just from exchange rate variance. Correct, yep. And you've already experienced some of that because we're down, what, 96 yes, today. That's right. Mm, it's and pretty the, good. And at the moment, we're leaving all of the money in the US in the hope that it comes yep. down. Okay. So at the moment, I'm capitalising the interest and the expectation that there's a benefit at the other end when 
yeah. um, when the exchange rate does come down. Okay, so where's the plan from here? At the moment, we've still got um, borrowing problems mm -hmm. because Jan's employment situation is still uncertain. Mm -hmm. It changes with the wind. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I was um, doing a presentation for the upcoming Platinum meeting mm -hmm. um, and I said in the presentation that Jan's employment was likely to change to permanent full-time employment <laughs> and two days later it changed. And now she's in a position where her employment's uncertain again. <laughs> so it sort of changes dramatically. So we still can't borrow, we'll still have, uh, we will still have difficulty borrowing. Mm -hmm. So at the moment we're um, doing a renovation of the PPR. Yep. Uh, we think we've got about $200,000 of additional equity there we can draw out. Mm -hmm. And we will at some point nervously approach the bank and see if we can get our uh, line of credit extended. And from there, I mean, you could obviously do a joint venture or something like that as, as well. More than likely, more yeah. than likely. Okay. Uh, yeah. So what's the next deal? Well, the next deal for us is still going to be another chunk deal probably, but I would want it to be a lot quicker than the last one. Mm -hmm. And I'd like it to be a lot bigger. Um, two townhouses is easy, but there's probably, uh, you know, you could do four or six and... Same amount of work. Same amount of work. Mm, that's right. Yeah, so I think I'd rather do something like that mm -hmm. um, if I could fund it. Yeah. So it's been a, a pretty huge turnaround from, you know, your days of of working because you were um, in sales and you were travelling a lot, weren't you? I was a technician. I was travelling all over Victoria, which uh -huh. was good at the time because I, I got to know more about the Victorian um, townships than I would have ever, ever had done it otherwise. Mm. So I, I knew a lot about what was happening in rural Victoria. Mm -hmm. And from an investment point of view, that was useful. Yeah. Not that we went there, but... Yeah. You could. Could have done, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, and Jan, she's uh, she's happy with the um, with her job and things like that at the moment. Well, she likes her work and she wants to keep working. Right. Um, she just doesn't like the environment she's working in because it's so uncertain. Mm. Okay. Uh, so it's really a matter of, of uh, you know put those strategic plays into place yes. and get yourself secure to be yes. able to move on. That's right. Okay. Yes. So talk to me. What um, what does your what does the future hold for you? Let's let's go down the track. Say five years. What's your life look like? I think in five years' time, we'll probably move to the coast. Right. That's This coast? No. <laughs> no, not this humid coast. We'll move to a cool coast. A cool coast. Tasmania. <laughs> probably um, Apollo Bay, somewhere there, mm -hmm. like that, um, on that southern coast. Mm. Uh, we'll probably still be doing real estate because mm -hmm. I think that's something you can do from anywhere. Mm. Um, and we'll probably be retired. Mm -hmm. essentially. We'll be doing real estate full time. Yeah, we'll do real estate full time. Yeah. Um, Which is effectively what you do now. Yeah, that's right. That's what I do now. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll probably, uh, neither of us are the type sit around and do nothing. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably start a small business or I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what, in mm -hmm. Apollo Bay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Apollo Bay is a target, huh? Yeah, Apollo Bay is a target for us. Okay, so what would you say to, to people who are contemplating um, doing real estate and doing real estate as a vehicle to replace income and grow wealth and those sorts of things? Well, we, we made the, the decision a long time ago that real estate was the, by far the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, by far the greatest amount of control. I mean, I think people only have to look back on history and look what the, the share markets have done mm -hmm. to realise that there is no control mm -hmm. and there's no guarantee. Mm -hmm. Um, real estate, uh, you can move your target. You know, mm. you might be in Melbourne one year and in Queensland the next, mm. uh, you know, because the, the markets are changing. Or in the US. Or in the US, absolutely. Yeah. The markets are changing. Mm. Uh, for us, the US was just a, um, the perfect storm, as you yeah. mentioned many times. It was, we just got to the point where we were debt free. Yeah. Uh, exchange rate were, was at the highest level. Mm. Um, real estate in Melbourne had taken a huge dive and um, the chances are that had we stayed in real estate in Melbourne, we would probably have not done another project for a long time simply because the market the had market fallen wasn't down. ready for that. Mm. So we had to move. Um, and for me, moving to, um, say, Queensland was really no worse than moving to the US. <laughs> it's a wild west frontier town at best. <laughs> You're talking to a Queenslander here. <laughs> So how long is the US a play for you? How long do you think you'll stay there? We can't see ourselves ever leaving it. There's okay. no reason. Mm -hmm. uh, Jan and I don't have any children, so we're not concerned about uh, mm -hmm. what happens as far as the US is concerned, mm -hmm. uh, so long as it delivers an income that we can rely on. Yeah. 
and that was what we preferred over mining towns, mm. was that um, when we reached the age of 85 and we're sitting around in a nursing home somewhere, we're not worried about what the mining towns are doing, we're mm. more going to be worried about what the US economy is doing. Mm. And we thought that, that would probably be more stable than the, mm. the mining towns. Okay. Uh, so there's no real need for us to leave. Okay. We did buy one property in Texas for growth. We'll probably sell out of that when it maxes. When the time's right. Yeah, when the time's right. And we'll move that into something that's more positive cash flow. So, you know, a lot of people who will be listening to this who are motivated by your story and, and you know, want to emula emulate you, um, they, you know, a lot of people are, are looking at uh, taking on another career and the education and all of that kind of stuff that comes with it. What would you say to those people? Well, I don't see that age is a barrier. I've never mm -hmm. felt that age is a barrier for anything that I've wanted to do. Um, so it, it's just a matter of um, doing it, really. I mean, there's a lot to learn. It's different, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when you're talking about the US. Yeah. Uh, what you'll find with the US is that uh, there's a lot of varying opinions about how you do things and how best to do things, mm -hmm. but it's just all a new mm -hmm. learning experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it's been easier because I'm not employed, so I don't have to uh, work around a full-time employment as well as trying to learn all this thing. But it's not hard. Mm. And in fact, um, when you step back, step back and look at, at uh, real estate in the US in particular, and all of the issues relating to tax and um, um, you know, self-managed super funds, yeah. is actually not much difference between the US and here. Mm. In fact, very little. Mm. And but people seem to make a lot of mistakes when they don't get the education right. <laughs> well, well, I've made a lot of mistakes mm. um, because I've been advised incorrectly by alleged self-managed super fund experts, for mm. example. But they're not hard to fix. Mm. The problems are not hard to fix. And, and mm. uh, uh, it's just simply a case of, you know, moving on. Mm. But, but for anybody of my age, um, it's to me, it's a perfect investment. Mm. It's keeps you occupied, keeps you on your toes. Mm. It's not really and what about the education side of it? Because obviously you took on the education and that costs money and, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit like any kind of education that you do. I, I'm not a good school person. <laughs> okay. Can, you yeah, seem to have sat through a heck of a lot of my seminars. I've sat through an enormous <laughs> number of your seminars and it's probably because I don't listen to most of them that oh, I've had to go now, so many now. times. Um, I, was, um, I was a failure in school. I mean, I left school after three years of high school. I was a complete failure. I finished in the bottom of my class. And I, mm -hmm. then I went on to study accountancy and I failed that too, despite the fact that uh, people say that nobody ever fails accountancy. Well, I did. Uh, so I'm not a school person. If anybody uh, can learn what I've learned over the last few years in real estate, then anybody can learn it. Mm -hmm. Because I just did not. I just do not take to school at all. Mm -hmm. um, so. What about the obstacle of, um, you know, paying for education and things like that? There, there's a cost and we knew that right from the outset. And when we made the decision to go into real estate and to join the Platinum Program, uh, that was one objective, was not mm. only to uh, get my income back, mm. but to recover all of those expenses that we had. Mm. And what happened was with us is that when we finished the project and we made the profit, we were able to repay all that that education mm. expenses. Mm. Um, and we, we put massive lump sums into superannuation and paid off other losses that we'd accumulated over the time. Um, in the end, I paid, on the profits that we made, I paid $46 tax. Wow. Yeah, so. You've had a few carried forward losses there then. <laughs> <laughs> and that was only because my accountant insisted on me having a tax return that was, was positive. <laughs> Okay, so you know, there's a lot to be learned in like the structures, the taxation, how all that kind of stuff comes yes. together, but also um, just the mechanics and the strategy of actually doing construction, doing US investing, and you know whatever else lies ahead for you, which is probably more construction. That that seems to be what um, what you know the strategy that's gelled the most with you. Well, one of the advantages of, of joining the programs, mm. be it Ultimate or be it Platinum, um, mm. is there's always a lot of people around to ask. Yeah. So if you don't know something, there's always somebody yeah. who's done it before you. Mm. It's mm. a very, very easy environment to learn in. Yeah. And you've done a great job of uh, putting together a fabulous feasibility study for all those people who perhaps maths is not their mm. favourite language. 
where we can just plug in the numbers yeah. and spits it out the other end. Well, I, I failed maths at high school, so um, that's one of the Well, reasons. I tell you what, that feasi <laughs> study, feasibility study program is pretty jolly good. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons why I did that program and started that program was simply mm. because I was lazy and didn't want to keep repeating Doing the same the figures. Mm. all over again. So mm. I just had to have something that mm. helped and that was what came of it. Yeah. No, well, it's a fabulous program too. So five years down the track, you're living on the beach. You're uh, yes. doing more projects probably. Yes. You've got an extensive portfolio in the US, continuing to invest over there. Yes. And Jan's not at work anymore. That was the plan. That's yes. the plan. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thanks, John.